Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about collegiate recovery back to the dorm. Joining us in our panel today are Daniel Fred, Project Director, Center for the Application of Substance Abuse Technologies, University of Nevada, Reno, Nevada. Dr. Vivian Barnett, Licensed Psychologist and Executive Director of Counseling Services at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University, Greensboro, North Carolina. Sarah Nirad, Program Manager at Collegiate Recovery Community and Director of Recovery, Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery, Columbus, Ohio. Anthony Alvarado, co-founder of Rise Together, Appleton, Wisconsin. So Sarah, what are the main issues affecting our colleges and universities when it comes to mental and or substance use disorders? Yeah, so alcohol continues to be one of the biggest problems on American colleges and universities, and there's so many things that then go into play when we're talking about binge drinking and, and high-risk drinking on a college campus. Okay. And uh, uh, Daniel, how do mental or substance use disorders affect students in the academic settings? You know, I think it can be multiple different ways. Depends on what the students struggle with. We do see that um, it, in that college age is where there's more prevalence with substance use disorders and mental health issues. Um, but also for people who are in recovery, because they're getting into recovery early and earlier, um, college can be difficult when there's not a support for those. And we have extreme stress environments uh, without the mental health support that students need to function in recovery. And Vivian, I suppose that some of these challenges are present for both students and administrators at these universities. It's not just the students who have the problem, but it's really the entire system that, that is affected. Yes, that's correct. I think on most campuses you'll find that students are struggling with their mental health needs as well as some of the needs around substance use and all those things that impact students that make them feel you know, pretty disconnected from the rest of the campus. So Anthony, can you talk to us, we, everybody's mentioned alcohol as a primary, but what other behavioral health issues do students face? Well, what we're seeing, you know, on college campuses or even earlier, so students are actually being challenged with um, a variety of uh, mental health disorders or, if anything, struggling with things like stress and anxiety and even depression. And when the students do face that, I mean, do most of them, do you think, um, come in with those conditions or are they exacerbated because of the stress? Vivian, I see you nodding your head. Yes, because what we're finding on campuses nationally is that more students are coming to college with already existing psychiatric concerns. And so they're seeking help, you know, to help them get through some of these difficult places where they are. But Sarah, there really is no difference whether they come in with the, with the disorder or whether they're experiencing it as a result of the stress that they feel. It, they, they just need to be addressed. Exactly. And having support services on campus, regardless of when the onset came. Okay. Um, the, I, I suppose also that, that it has a lot to do with how well a student, Daniel, transitions from the high school setting into the college setting. Yeah, which is a, a tricky subject when you talk about transition because college has become kind of a rite of passage and part of that has been experimentation with drug use and in the high stress environment and it's almost assumed, assumed to be in these unhealthy environments is our rite of passage. Mm -hmm. And so the, the transition, it's important that we begin to also talk about finding the supports you need and finding your mental health supports and whether it's learning about meditation to working out or wellness planning. Um, whatever it is, to f we, we need to be make students aware of other supports they need during this transition. So Anthony, um, how do these problems affect the academic performance uh, of students? Well, what you can see is lower grades, uh, maybe even missing out on classes altogether, and also even dropping out of college and missing out on tuition for that college or university. And overall, even to add to uh, Daniel's point earlier, 
um, one of the things that we're seeing, you know, a lot of the drug use is starting at an earlier age, between 14 to 15 years old. And most of the students that uh, we've been in front of, it, seeing a high amount of stress, about 78% of the students that we're in front of. And we've been in front of a lot, about 120 thousand plus students over the last three years. So as they transition to college, it is important indeed to give them support uh, as, as much as you can throughout that process, even before they make it that big step into their adult life. Very good. Uh, Vivian, let's talk about student safety. I suspect that uh, all the challenges that these students are facing are, are really a big threat to their safety as well. It certainly is. Mm -hmm. A lot of things happen in the residence hall when students are either drinking too much or they're driving and they've been pulled over because of having too much alcohol in their system, um, just getting in arguments and just relationship problems, lots of things that can deal with safety and violence or even criminal things that could happen to a student once they, you know, are consuming alcohol or have too many drugs in their system or they just have a, a history of mental health problems. Mm -hmm. So we have some folks in recovery in the panels here. I'm going to start with you. H how was your uh, entry into the college system? And, and, and what, tell us a little bit about your own story. Yeah, so I intentionally chose to stay at home and go to a community college because I was really worried. How can I go into an environment that is full of excess and partying and I'm still so early so in my recovery. So you were already in recovery when you went in. Correct. Mm -hmm. And um, so I chose to stay at home because I knew I would need my recovery support services. And I ended up choosing to transfer to a major university that had a collegiate recovery program because I knew I'd need that. And that I was going into an environment that typically isn't very recovery friendly. So I absolutely made a decision based on my recovery and which school I went to. Very good. How about you, Daniel? So I actually, uh, I say I did my research in uh, substance use disorders in college. So I developed um, my substance use disorder in college my first couple years. And, uh, and how did that happen? I mean, I, I need our audience to understand yeah. how, what is the progression of, of how a student, because obviously there are parents in our audience that are going to say, oh, no, my child will not do that. Right. I, I think for me... Um, it was just wanting to kind of fit in was a, was a big part of it. Um, but I also had some situations my, my freshman year, my roommate um, had committed suicide and I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know we had counseling services. I never went to see a counselor. I never went to um, take part of the mental health services we had on campus because I just didn't know they existed. And so my way of coping with that began to be alcohol and drugs. And pretty soon you get to a place to where you don't want to be sober and that's where I got to and um, just a series of events led me to Texas and and that's where um, I, I hit my bottom so to speak. Um, so was also, it from your freshman year in school or? or? Yes ma'am yeah so it was my my first semester I did okay and it was the end of that semester that that we had this situation um, and after that I mean that second semester was was almost immediately into, you know, the harmful use. Very good. How about you, Anthony? Yeah, you know, I mean, it started in high school, and then as I transitioned into college, you know, by that time I had a full-fledged uh, addiction and, you know, completely addicted to a variety of substances, especially alcohol. Um, so as I moved into this arena, if you will, that accepted uh, this use and actually promoted it, it became quite difficult to attend classes, to show up on time, um, to go ahead and even have the interest. And um, I didn't feel, you know, the need to ask for help at that point in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a lack of guidance. And eventually I ended up dropping out that first year um, where I went back eventually um, sometime down the road. Um, Already in recovery. In recovery. Absolutely. Right. And when we come back, we are going to be talking about how we handle these situations in the collegiate setting through recovery programs. We'll be right back. I entered recovery when I was 17 years old. I was starting my junior year of high school and it was a really exciting time, but also a really scary time to be young and really starting my life over. 
but I'm grateful that I was in a community that had a ton of adolescent and young adult recovery support services. So I was able to receive the full continuum of care. I was able to be a part of an alternative peer group, which was recovery support services for young people after school. I was able to go to an alternative high school, so I received recovery supports along with my education. I then was able to go off to a collegiate recovery program and have a really fun and normal college experience. And that whole time I was able to work with phenomenal clinicians that provided developmentally appropriate clinical care to me. I was able to benefit from treatment um, and really everything that you need to enter and sustain recovery. And the biggest thing that was consistent through all of those was that I had peers that were also in recovery. My recovery has allowed me to become the woman that I was always meant to be, that I had just kind of lost along the way. My recovery has given me a core set of values to fall back on and make decisions based on. My recovery has given me the ability to show up for life today, to be a good daughter, a good sister, a good employer, a good student, and ultimately a good member of my community. Staying on course without support is tough. With help from family and community, you get valuable support for recovery from a mental or substance use disorder. Join the Voices for Recovery. Visible. Vocal. Valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Sarah, let's talk a little bit about collegiate recovery programs and how they begin to address the challenges that we just talked about. Yeah, collegiate recovery programs are phenomenal services to really wrap around the student and provide them with a supportive peer community so they can have that sense of belonging and identity, as well as some professional recovery support services. Everything from preparing to entering the workforce and graduating to kind of crisis management, as well as kind of navigating the university as a whole. Very good. Daniel, does that include sober dorms and what are they? Yeah, I think it um, depends on what the university is willing to do and what is available and what the needs of that university are. Um, but anywhere from sober dorms to a drop-in center to hang out to meeting spaces to, you know, to evening, weekend activities. Uh, and I think it really is, the great thing about this movement is it's organic in the sense that it can be catered to the needs of the university and, and quite honestly, the willingness of what the university is willing to do. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about that, uh, Vivian, because mm -hmm. I think that universities do need to almost establish policies mm -hmm. in order to institute these. Talk, to, talk to a little bit of, to us about, about those uh, uh, challenges within, within that sector. Well, you're absolutely right. There are policies that need to be developed. You know, first we have to inform the community about what's happening. Sometimes on our college campuses, administrators may not realize that students are here that are in need of recovery. And then how are those policies punitive to those students that keep them from coming back to school once something happens to them? And so we want to make sure that they are clear, that they are explicit, and that they address those needs that the students may have when things like this happen to them. Mm -hmm. How do you interact, Anthony, with some of these programs? How does your, your effort? Well, you know, engaging a student and providing education is, is one fold. But as you look at um, individuals that come up to you and they uh, maybe ask for help, maybe they ask for guidance, having a recovery community center, whether it's within a community or within a college, is an excellent resource to connect them to the things that are happening within that community. Like Sarah said, you know, what kind of supports are there? What kind of guidance? What does the current landscape look like? How can I navigate my school? How can I navigate my local community so I can find support groups or mentorship or maybe um, some peers? And also, let's not forget, I'm in recovery, I also want to be able to have fun. Mm -hmm. So the pro-social activities, maybe I'm going to go bowling, maybe there's a movie night, maybe there's a sober party going on and I'm going to get my dance on. You know, all those things can be a great resource and support somebody's long-term recovery. But is your program a general program or is your program uh, college specific? Well, most of the time we get a chance to work with middle schools and high school students. Okay. So when we address um, those mental health disorders or maybe students that are struggling with addiction or impacted by addiction, uh, we can do it at a much earlier age and in hopes to prevent it mm -hmm. from getting worse. Absolutely. Right. 
Absolutely. Sarah, let's talk a little bit about a history so the audience understands what the history is of these programs. How did they start? Yeah, so back in the 80s, early 80s, the first university, uh, which was Brown, so an Ivy League school, started supporting students in recovery. Um, and it kind of took off from there. For a long time, it was just a small handful um, of programs, Texas Tech, Augsburg, Rutgers. Um, and we really saw back in, what, like 2013, with Stacy Mathewson and Transforming mm -hmm. Youth Recovery, mm -hmm. schools received um, seed money, startup grants. And so we saw this huge growth in the number of programs. And before then, Texas Tech had received a replication grant from SAMHSA. So we saw some programs grow then. But it's really been within the last few years that we've seen a huge rise in the number of programs. Mm -hmm. Daniel, though, um, do people really do, do they need seed money? Do universities really need seed money? Or is there, is there a way of students themselves to move the, the issue forward? I know that Robert Ashford was at the University of North Texas, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. and he went in and he really, I don't know whether he had support or not, but mm -hmm. he, I think within a year he had set up mm -hmm. a program. So is it possible? for students to come together and to push this issue forward without yeah. having support. Although I, I recognize mm -hmm. right. and value very much right. what Stacy Mathewson has done. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I think yes. <laughs> yes and yes. I think if you um, students can get together and they can get their recovery off campus and they can do some meetings on campus and kind of support each other. But when we talk about collegiate recovery programs and really offering support, um, you need university backing, you need some staff for that. There's been a lot of research that shows how that helps. Mm -hmm. And so I think money gets the attention um, of the university. And so you take Robert Ashford's example, University of North Texas, they had a minor and a couple other places that were already understood substance use disorders. And then you bring in this seed grant and it gets the attention of the university. And then you had kind of the perfect environment to create something really quickly. And other universities have that there's minors all over the nation. And I think, you know, and it, so it depends on the university, the attention they can get. Um, at our university, our president was really supportive of this program. His, his focus is on the whole student. And so it was really beneficial for us as well. Very good. Vivian, we, you talked about the community coming together and moving forward. Take us on a step by step. If, if, if I'm listening to this show and I really don't know anything about establishing a program, what do I need to, to know if, if I'm either a parent who's concerned, you know, because I have a child, or if I'm a student who has seen, you know, the problems and I'm in recovery myself and I don't have any support as, as, as a, you know, our, 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 our folks have, have just mentioned here. I mean, what, what does one do? Well, I think the first thing is raising awareness, you know, really campaigning the campus about what is happening. And know. who do they approach? Well, we've approached students, you know, incoming students, parents, faculty, staff, just really talking to everyone about collegiate recovery. And so that's the first thing is really just making people aware of what's happening. How do we recruit students to our campus that may be in recovery? And so having a place, a dedicated space for our students is just a wonderful mm -hmm. thing to do because students are looking for places to connect with other people that are similar to them, that have certain problems that they want to talk about, but not to the general public, maybe mm -hmm. just to people that are very much like how they are. So our first thing that we did was to really establish awareness, tabling events, lots of tailgating, all those things that you were talking about, so that people would know that we exist. We also have sober housing, you know, for students that actually are interested. And when we were talking at orientation, we get up and we talk about, you know, ways that parents can get their mm -hmm. kids involved. Mm -hmm. And so they see us afterwards figure out how to do that, and get them into those residence halls. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. So, Anthony, they, they, you need signage, you need, you need a pool of people to be calling other people. How, do, how does that 
Well, typically how we go ahead about it is we engage with students through a variety of educational campaigns. So whether it's a school speaking campaign or we do a student workshop or maybe you do an awareness effort to via online and within that community, I think that's a majority of the reason why we get contacted um, by high schools and colleges. I mean, we have this really great ability to develop resilient leaders and like advocates that can speak out about the issues that they care about and they can also reach out for help at a much earlier age and then they can really start to focus on their dreams goals and aspirations but a lot of times what we see is there's so much silence or stigma around this issue yeah. to the sense where nobody is talking about it or not like we would like to see right so it becomes a little bit of a hush hush conversation within the school but an awareness event that engagement mm -hmm. people are empowered by that mm -hmm. and they step forward and they're like I want to get involved that or I want to support that as a faculty member or as a teacher or as a university as a whole. And Sarah, I'm coming back to you. That is a very key point that Anthony just made. He talked about leadership, mm -hmm. which is yet another aspect of these collegiate programs Absolutely. is that people in recovery can in essence rid themselves of this stigma and really step up and become leaders. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Collegiate Recovery Programs are doing a great job of kind of taking this cohort of students and equipping them with leadership skills, professional development, all kind of framed in the lens of you're in recovery and so how do we disclose that in a job interview? You know, how do we talk about our criminal history and things like that? Um, so we've seen our students, I mean, I think a lot of us are great examples here of mm -hmm. when given the right environment, the right support. Well, that's really what I want to talk Yeah. About. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're given um, the ability to thrive Absolutely. and really grow as young professionals and future leaders. And um, really what we have is a cohort, and that's what we're doing, leadership and professional development. Very good. Anything to add? Yeah, I think, too, I think it's important to add, talking about starting, I always tell people, start where you're at with what you have. And when I was a grad student and had a faculty that would listen to me, um, I didn't know any other students in recovery. Some people have a group of students in recovery, um, but there's some good resources on transforming youth recovery to see if it already exists at your web at your university um, and ARHE's website as well to see what exists. There may be one happening on your campus and you're not even aware of it. Is there a special in closing, because we have to move on for this sector, but I just want to ask you, Anthony, is there a special moment where you say, you know, I can step up, I can, I can be a leader, I can, mm -hmm. I can do this and help other students? I think that moment comes in the essence of seeing somebody else uh, maybe share their story. Okay. Um, maybe it's one-on-one. -on -one or in front of a community. And that's where you start to really develop that relatability to what we're talking about. And that's where you have that love and that compassion. And then you have that passion to move forward and become a leader in your community, even if it's just in a very small community. Very good, and when we come back, we're gonna talk about the role of families and peers in this process. We'll be right back. may feel that binge drinking or drug use is a normal rite of passage at college. But the fact is most students don't binge drink or use drugs and it's important for them to know that these activities can lead to serious health problems. Nearly 20% of college students do meet the criteria for an alcohol use disorder. SAMHSA supports various grant programs and other resources designed to promote behavioral health among college students. Because some college students are over the minimum legal drinking age of 21, college programs targeting this age group typically emphasize the prevention of excessive drinking. Other programs aim to enhance mental health promotion and address mental health issues such as suicide. SAMHSA has also offered trainings in a variety of publications that address the behavioral health needs of college students. For example, the fact sheet, Talking with Your College-Bound Young Adult About Alcohol, provides parents with the information they need to talk with their college-bound young adults about alcohol use consequences. A SAMHSA brochure, You're in Control, Using Prescription Medicine Responsibly, Not Worth the Risk, informs college-age people about the risks of using prescription drugs or over-the-counter drugs non-medically and offers tips for how to cope with the stress and pressure of college demands. For those directly involved in student support, SAMHSA offers the report, Student Mental Health Leaders and College Administrators, Counselors and Faculty in Dialogue Building Bridges, Mental Health on Campus, which offers recommendations to promote recovery for college students.
Transforming Youth Recovery is a 501c3 nonprofit set up to do research, funding, and programs around students in the education system as well as uh, the family and the community. Our goal is that every institution of higher education is going to be providing recovery support um, to their students. The two primary areas of focus for the collegiate team at Transforming Youth Recovery is providing support to the staff, faculty, and student leaders who are trying to build collegiate recovery programs and also to connect those leaders from around the country to one another so that they feel as though they have a network of support. The initial goal was to celebrate my son's recovery. And um, a year after my, um, I started the foundation, my son did die of an overdose. Our founder and CEO, Stacy Mathewson, pledged back in 2013 to give $110,000 grants to universities to help them start these programs. To date, we've given about 125. As the founder uh, and a philanthropist, um, I decided to go ahead and put um, a significant amount of money into this nonprofit. So what we're able to do is provide research and programming in a very fast pace because we have the funding to do so. When Transforming Youth Recovery started giving grants, there were only about 35 programs in existence that we could identify. Now, three years later, about three years later, there are over 175 institutions doing this. It's extremely important to have support services on campus specifically for substance use disorders and other addiction type um, tendencies because when they have that program on campus available, it gives a person on campus the ability you know, to seek that help but also gives the university a chance to learn and grow with how this can make a difference for not only that individual, but for the university. College life in general, and especially at the age that uh, we're at, early 20s, um, it's a huge, crucial time in like the development of the rest of our lives, and that puts a lot of stress on us. Through having you know programs like this on campus, you know we're helping those students number one, be okay with who they are, find a solution, and really you know prosper in society. Our goal is to give 100 more $10,000 seed grants to institutions who are starting collegiate recovery programs. Um, we're looking to give a number of what we're calling roots for growth grants over the next three years to current grantee institutions to kind of give them a little boost in funding and technical support, um, really toward the goal of reaching sustainability and institutional acceptance. And third, we are embarking on our first community college specific grant program. The reason that um, being in recovery is so important um, really is because then you have your life. And then you have um, the chance of a good life, in addition to possibly saving your life. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Hey Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Vivian, before we move on to talk about the role of family, I want to talk about uh, how these programs uh, really address the issues of racial and ethnic uh, students? Well, as you know, most ethnic minorities do not readily identify as having some type of addiction. So they learn to manage their, you know, anxiety and stress or depression or drinking just through a variety of other ways. Only the time 
that they will come to a counseling center or come to a collegiate recovery, it's when their world is falling apart. It's when they suffer personal crises, you know, family problems, economic problems, those kinds of things. And then during our clinical interview and some type of intervention that we're doing with them, we learn that they also have some problems around drugs and alcohol. Has that been your experience in terms of uh, do ethnic uh, African American, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American students really, you know, manifest a, 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 a desire to join the programs or, or are there special efforts that need to be made as Vivian has mm -hmm. noted? Yeah, I think we need to recognize that there are a lot of cultural differences. So some folks um, don't go to the counseling center typically, you know, they mm -hmm. keep it in the family, they go to the church. So I think we need to be really strategic and thoughtful in our outreach mm -hmm. efforts to making sure we're not going to the same places where maybe all of the white students continue to go. We need to broaden our efforts, engage faith leaders, engage folks in the multicultural center to make sure like we were talking about our campaign and our mm -hmm. outreach efforts are everywhere. Yeah. Um, but I think programs typically have been a lot more Caucasian and I think there's so many factors that play into that, you know, help seeking behavior um, when we're looking at um, just colleges and universities not being very diverse yeah. to begin with. So there, we have much work mm -hmm. to do to ensure everyone has access to treatment and recovery. Yeah. And I think too, it comes to, it makes me think of multiple pathways to recovery. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so not just embracing one pathway um, in the collegiate recovery setting, and also rec recognizing recovery kind of becomes its own culture. And that's sort of what we're, we're doing in a sense of when you walk into a collegiate recovery program, you can talk the same language and, and communicate with the same, the same values and beliefs in a sense, even if it's different pathways of recovery. Um, but there does need to be a lot of work in addressing some of the higher ed issues um, as well as some of the diversity issues in recovery in general. And Anthony, I suppose that that has a lot to do with the whole notion of leadership that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier, which means that we really do need the programs that right. are set up need to uh, be uh, extra sensitive to, to be able to draw from those Mm -hmm. uh, students, uh, you know, the minority students to, to bring them in and to turn mm -hmm. them into peer leaders, correct? Absolutely. I mean, even if throughout the Midwest, when we work with tribal nations, you know, a lot of times we enter into those communities and we're very conscious of how we engage them, how we speak to them, what kind of language do we use? And then once you do engage leaders, you know, what is that process for them? How can they connect with their peers and how can they continue to, you know, um, be there for others, but also collectively help to build other advocates that can be by their side. Very good. Vivian, let's turn now to the role of the family and the role of parents or, or significant others that are, that are taking care of or watching out for those students that are, that are in trouble. What is their role in terms of how they relate to the collegiate program or how they, they, they would need to support them? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first role is just acceptance that there is a problem, something that's going on with their son or daughter, and then move from advising to coaching, collaboration, those kinds of things are very helpful for students when parents are not putting mandates upon them or you know, thinking that they're lazy or they're just not connecting or they're not very smart, but they actually have a disorder, a concern that's impacting how they are progressing through college. And so bringing the family together, you know, through either family meetings and talking about some of those things that are happening, you know, talking to, like you mentioned, Sarah, some of the faith leaders, you know, connecting them with different campus resources so that their son or daughter can get the help that they need. And I think engaging family like I know at Ohio State, that's really hard because we have families all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, so supporting them can be a challenge because also we have to be mindful of FERPA. There's mm -hmm. laws we have to follow, how much and we can explain share. Explain what FERPA is and what it stands for. Don't know what it stands for, but maybe y'all do. Um, but we can't share a student's academic records with anyone unless they give us permission. So similar mm -hmm. to HIPAA, which is your mm -hmm. health information, this is more on the academic side. Um, so we really try and talk as much as we can to the student, like when they're applying to the collegiate mm -hmm. recovery program and wanting to come. 
Um, but we, you know, also support families in that we invite them to our tailgates, we send them a newsletter, mm -hmm. we invite yeah. them to our graduation dinner. So I think colleges and universities are kind of a tough environment in that they're not always right there mm -hmm. in that community. So. But definitely families need to be engaged. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk now. We've talked about what some of the components are, some of the supports, and I really need to get to uh, how students are trained to be peer support specialists. Are, is there a special training within the program that students go through? How does that work? So I, I know at uh, in Rabbit, Nevada, so our collegiate recovery program, um, they just did a training through some brass tax monies to take what's out there as far as peer recovery support training. And you mean and brass tax from the Center for Substance Abuse? Uh, uh, yes. No, the it's Center for Mental Health Social Services. Yes. It's actually, and, 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 and CSAT Sansa. as well, yeah. yes. Yeah, all through there. And so it was, um, the idea was to develop, because there's a lot of recovery coach training and different things out there that um, a lot of it doesn't apply to college students. There's, long. It's a different, yeah, and they're really long. And so um, they developed some training that I know they're going to send out as well that is specific to peer support training because mm -hmm. we did find an issue with training leaders um, is, is difficult. And I know there's all kinds of resources. There's recovery ally trainings that Ohio State's done and YPR has different trainings and, and stuff like that. And that's young um, people in recovery. Young people in recovery, yes. Thank you. Um, and so I think it's there's some stuff out there, but it's there's not a lot that's real specific. That this is this is how we train students. Um, but I would and what is the difference in terms of of training students? Let's talk a little bit between the adult peer support versus the student. I suppose it it it, it has more to do with the generational than than anything else. Yeah, maybe the lens that it's viewed through. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if the problems that maybe a collegiate peer supporter would be dealing with would probably be very different than someone um, that's older and out in the community and not going to school. So maybe some of the scenarios. Mm -hmm. And also I know in Ohio, ours is like 40-hour training. you got to go that whole week. And that's hard for our college students. So we need to meet them where they are. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. Vivian, talk to us specifically Within your program, uh, do you train uh, peer support specialists and how, how does it happen? Well, that's great because actually our program is housed in counseling services. Okay. And so many of the staff are already trained as licensed you know, professional counselors, social workers, psychologists. And so we're using those models of recovery already with students that are coming in individually. And so we recruit students and students are our best advocates on campus because peers listen to peers. And so they are able to recruit for us, make um, announcements, you know, do all of our tabling and tailgating events and those kinds of things. And students seem to connect better with those peers. And so we meet weekly with them, uh, set an agenda, telling them what we need done on our campus. Mm -hmm. They make it happen. And it's such a great way to get students involved. It looks good on their resume. They've actually reached out. Mm -hmm. Some of the students are actually in recovery and so they are participating as well and so we use them like tremendously on our campus. How about you Anthony in yeah. terms of your program do you use the peer model and we do I mean even from an educator standpoint you know being a recovery coach a recovery coach or a peer support specialist and being able to engage you know youth at different points in their life I think it's really awesome to be able to do that but what I'm really excited about is to continue the conversation around building a model that can be successful within high school as well mm -hmm. I think it would be phenomenal to be able to have that transition and maybe there's even a day where college students can work a little bit more with I high school students absolutely. and make that you know possible mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. because they can really listen to it maybe if they're two or three years older and mm -hmm. they can really listen to what's going on and and maybe relate a little more yeah. you know right. to the experience that they're going to be facing correct yeah, yeah. and I think there's some great examples of that so I think about the University of Texas mm -hmm. at Austin mm -hmm. there's a collegiate recovery program yep. and then University High School which is a recovery mm -hmm. high school right. and so the college students go and they're mentors to the students they do events together and really model for them like yep. You can stay clean and sober, and you can go to college. Yeah. And that would be, if someone was looking to set up a program, would that be the ideal? I think if your community has enough mm -hmm. of the pieces, 
Absolutely. And what are those pieces? You need adolescent treatment, you need youth recovery supports, you need um, families that are willing to send their kid to the recovery high school, and then you need a university that's really gonna have a collegiate recovery program with institutional mm -hmm. support and backing. Okay, so when we come back, what I wanna do is really get at the nitty gritty of how individuals need to deal with the university administration and how if parents wants to get involved and establish a program or work with the students, you know, how, how that is done. We'll be right back. Suicide is a huge issue on college campuses, and there's many reasons for this. We know that about one in 10 college students has thoughts of suicide in any given year. We also know that in terms of mental health and addictions, young adulthood is a critical time. For uh, First of all, it's the time where the most prevalence, where most mental health and substance use disorders uh, occur, and yet it's also the age period where there's the less uh, help-seeking behavior. So we know one in five college students will have a behavioral health disorder in any given year, yet only one in three will actually seek services that they need. So on campuses, it's critical. College and academic programs really need to address mental health and addictions on campus. And uh, there are resources that are available that can help these institutions develop programs. For instance, at SAMHSA, our Garrett Lee Smith Suicide Prevention Grant Program helps provide resources for universities and other academic institutions develop suicide prevention programs. It's also important that to make folks aware of resources like our Suicide Prevention Resource Center, as well as the Suicide Prevention Lifeline that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 800-273, and then the letters TALK, that's 800-273-8255. It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible, vocal, valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The University of Nevada here in Reno was the first pilot grant grantee institution of transforming youth recovery. NRAP at the University of Nevada Reno, which is Nevada's recovery and prevention, um, is what we have put together here on campus. Uh, it's a facility so that students can come in as a drop-in center, um, whether it's to do their homework, hang out and chat with other people, play video games, or um, sit down with somebody here and you know just have a one-on-one. -on -one. What's really exciting to see is that it has grown over the last three years to be institutionally accepted. When we started, it was a small group of us, about eight to 10. Um, and I think now, from what I've been hearing and the numbers that I've been seeing, you know, we have upwards of you know, 80 plus students a week coming through um, the doors. Until I had a place like NRAP, I didn't necessarily feel safe uh, with myself at school. It's really difficult because, especially when I first got into recovery, like I didn't know anybody who was in recovery. I was super afraid and didn't ever want to admit that I was an alcoholic or an addict. Like, to me, I felt like I was lesser of a person, and I feel like that is how the community kind of perceives us. Students feel as though they need to choose between their recovery and their education. That if they go back to school, that might threaten their sobriety. NRAP to me is kind of a safe haven on campus. It's a place where people in recovery or allies of 
um, can come and hang out and there's no judgment or stigmas here. I leave here feeling better every single time than I came in. I have certain tools for life. This is my college tool. We need to ensure that these individuals who do better than their peers when they go back to campus in terms of academics um, feel supported and feel like they have a place on that campus. What I found uh, with my own recovery is that like you need a strong foundation to build upon and uh, NRAP has helped me build a strong foundation to grow and excel with. Like having the strength of the community here to back me um, helps me further myself. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. So Sarah, let's talk about, I know that you're, you, you're very much an up front and center in terms of how to get these programs going. Where are the resources for the administrators? You know, and because there has to be resources. If I'm going to go out and I'm a student or someone who wants to prove my point, yeah. I have to say, well, you know what, there, sir or madam, there are these resources here that you can tap, and, and what are those? Yeah, so there are a number of them. Um, for starters, the Association of Recovery and Higher Education has some great resources on their website, Transforming Youth Recovery, and then the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. Um, and we also have data. Like we have some research articles, and that's a great place to start from as well. And so where can people find the data? Those three websites will have links okay. to all the articles. Okay, and the type of, of materials that are there, where are they policies, are they guides, are they yeah. how-to, or all of the above? little bit of some of what you said. So Texas Tech actually has a replication curriculum that can be helpful. Um, Transforming Youth Recovery probably has the most resources as far as some um, guides, suggestions on how to do fundraising or how to do outreach, but there's a huge void in resources to really learn more about the nitty gritty. Any others, Daniel, that you can think of? Yeah, well, I think of the toolkits that are on, on Transform Youth Recovery are good too, but also looking out about, there's a lot happening right now at the national level. And so even using, you know, articles of, there's states that have mandated, you know, every college over this number of students. I think it was, I want to say Virginia, um, New Jersey, and a couple other states, North Carolina, needs to have collegiate recovery services on these universities. And so, and then also getting, um, you know, other universities that have institutionalized programs and getting some of those letters and, and these things that are out there that may not be at a website, but doing a search for it and finding, um, finding those resources help kind of solidify what we're doing, you know, and that this isn't, because honestly, when you go talk to an administrator, um, you know, the first time we, we talked to our administrator about getting space, they said, well, we don't have those types of students on our campus, because they hide, they're not open, they're, they're scared, they're, they're doing really well usually, um, academically, and so they kind of go under the radar because they're, they're having a difficult time, and so you need other kind of solutions. Very good. Mm -hmm. Vivian. I just wanted to add that yes. there are quite a few, you know, online resources like you Lifeline is mm -hmm. one, Active Minds, um, mm -hmm. NAMI is another one, SAMHSA, you know, lots of ways that people can first understand what it is that's going on with their son or daughter and then, you know, utilize some of those services, some grants that are out there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Vivian, let's continue with you. Let's say that someone was asking you to clarify for an administrator or a professor that's in charge of the student uh, 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 academic uh, sector within a university. And what do they need to know about these programs that help mental and substance use disorder issues within their student body? What do they need to understand and what do they need to know? I actually speak to quite a few professors on campus, as well as I cabinet sometimes about, you know, some of the concerns that our students have. And so the first thing I do is talk about, it's probably one in four people in this room that has some type of mental health disorder. So it brings it home to them. And if we look in our families or our friends, we notice that they are also you know, suffering from something. And so maybe making it more 
tangible, real mm -hmm. for them to identify is the best way. And then I start to talk about like how mental health impacts mm -hmm who they are and who the student is. And the student is and not- And co-occurring conditions as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. And <clears throat> the student is not the disorder, it's the student, and then they have this condition. Mm -hmm. So being able to talk to faculty and staff about that, making it real for them, and then you know telling them about resources that are available on campus, off campus. We have an advisory committee that consists of our community partners that come, help our students, and we talk about what they need to do in order to help that student stay in school. And so that's very helpful. And we invite university officials to be a part of that team as well. And Anthony, how would you then, what would need to happen in order for high school administrators and principals to understand that they need a program in their high schools? Well, I think it's actually addressing the administration and staff collectively together. You know, like it was stated earlier, every community is going to be different, and so is every student. So really being able to engage them, having a conversation, identifying the current needs, what is the, the priority, right? And what are some of the objectives that you can lay out? Um, to that other point, um, you know, with some of the things that we were talking about earlier, awareness is so crucial in these steps. And when you look at resources, a lot of times when we have people try to come out of the conversation and, and really start talking about these things in their community, whether it's staff, administration, university level, um, we need to be able to engage those students. And you know, things and resources, uh, programs like Rise Together, for example, uh, Party.0, even taking a look at other you know, community initiatives uh, through facing addiction or drugs over dinner, those can help extend the conversations around addiction and even mental health for that matter, even at home. Because let's not forget, if we want to change the world, the transformation needs mm -hmm. to start there. Absolutely, right. absolutely. I, I think too, Yvette, sorry if I can cut in, I think um, we need to tell administrators and, and they need to know that these, these students are a really good investment. Mm -hmm. The return on university dollars is incredible. Um, because we're not just keeping students sober or clean or from having mental health issues. When you invest in these students, they have higher GPAs, higher graduation rates, higher retention rates, and many of them go on to grad school. They go on to, you know, many of our students have gotten married, buy good houses, get a good job, pay into the economy. And so when you look at the university money that goes into this, the return on the investment for the community and for the student um, is well worth it. Very good. Anthony, I want to go back to you because everyone else noted that there were resources available. What resources are available for the high school sector if people wanted to set up programs? Well, when we engage them, we provide most of the resources mapped out on our site, uh, Rise Together. Um, so with that being said, there's even other really great organizations that are providing resources to teens, like the Newport Academy. Um, all that can be found on site. And then also we continue the engagement in other pro-social activities. So looking at like Crave 21 or Wait 21, uh, those are excellent resources that provide education, student engagement, even take a, a sobriety pledge and really transition into that college mm -hmm. scholarship opportunity to extend that like statement of sobriety and health and well-being um, at a, such a young age, which is awesome. Very good. Before we wrap up, I usually let our guests have a last thought, and I'm going to start the way that I introduced you, with Daniel giving about a, less than a minute of your final thoughts. Yeah, I think it's, you know, when we talk about collegiate recovery, um, it's important just to not give up and, and to start. and and. It's getting a little easier. There's more support nationally. We're recognizing the need for it. Um, but I think not to give up um, if you're starting this program because it's worth it and not to have your sights too far ahead. Very good, thank you. Vivian. Mm -hmm. Well, I think about collegiate recovery, similar to what you're talking about, Daniel, but also strength. It's a strength base, you know. Mm -hmm. We focus so much on what students, you know, aren't doing well, but collegiate recovery is an opportunity for students to be leaders, to recognize those strengths and talents that they are bringing. Sarah. So I would say that collegiate recovery programs are a phenomenal investment. And if you are building one of these programs, know that um, you do a little bit as you can. Your program's going to look like what it looks like at your campus, and everyone's is going to be different. And you make it work however you can. Very good. Mm -hmm. Anthony. 
When I think about collegiate recovery, I can't help but to think about the earlier stages. When we talk about uh, fifth grade students or even younger and starting to engage the conversation in that school environment, at home, throughout the community, it is absolutely crucial that we start identifying these topics and start breaking some of that silence. Also throughout middle school, because we know that's where a lot of the drug use starts to pick up. And then moving into high school, developing resilience, helping them to overcome their challenges and speak out about the issues uh, that students want to be heard. They, they want to be loved. And, and some of those students out there are actually hopeless. And what can help that? I think this uh, peer support and this network, those connections back to community can help save those lives. Well, we've come to the end of our show and I want to thank you for being here. I also want to remind our audience that National Recovery Month happens every September, but we have a wonderful web page that you can go to, recoverymonth.gov. We want to encourage everyone in the community to celebrate recovery and in a particular way to celebrate those that are working in collegiate programs. Uh, uh, be present and support those in recovery, particularly if you're a family member, and do go to our website to post all of your events and activities throughout the year. I want to thank you for being here. It's been a great show. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. To watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. My story is yours. I am a mother. I'm a father. A son. A daughter. I am in recovery from a mental illness. A substance use disorder. With support from family and community. We, we are, are victorious. victorious. Join the Voices for Recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.